Good morning, everybody. Hey, good morning. How you doing? Pretty good. How about you? We're doing all right. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> we'll let uh, another moment go by before we get started. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, morning. How are everybody doing? Doing well. That's a blessing. Amen. Thank you for your cards, Vanessa. Oh, baby, it's no problem. Thank you for all yeah. y'all prayers and love over the years. Yes. You just don't know how much that uh, helped us here with our grandchild and daughter. It just it just overwhelming sometimes, but you got to keep going, right? right? Oh yeah, that's right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, all. Good morning. Morning, 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 morning. Morning. Prayers of the righteous. Thank you so much. Amen. All right, y'all. We'll go ahead and get started. And I'm sure more people will be joining us shortly. Um, we'll go ahead and open with prayer. Let us bow. Father, we thank you for this day, this opportunity to learn more of your word, Father, to know these sayings that you would have us to know to, <clears throat> to instill in our minds, Lord, that we can apply them to our walk in this world as we're walking to you and with you, Father. We beg forgiveness and we ask that you can teach us to be forgiving of others. We ask to always seek to be in your presence, Lord. That way, at any moment, whenever we think of sin, maybe creeping back into our lives, we can remember that if we are in your presence, we want to remain holy, Father, so we abstain from that sin. We thank you, Lord. We love you. We beg your will is done and not our own. And we ask all this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 All right, y'all. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, we're picking it up in chapter 12. Um, just a little recap. Last... Uh, few chapters we've been doing this sort of uh, contrast between the righteous and the wicked um you know we we see how a righteous man lives how a just man lives and then we see um the contrary to that right we see how wicked people live their life um in contrast to what the righteous are doing uh and it's it's more so that you know they they choose to live this way as opposed to uh, choosing to serve God and to uh, live after the precepts that God has already instilled. You know, we've got to think also uh, at the time that Solomon had wrote these Proverbs, they've already had the law, um, you know, the, the Mosaic law already in place. You know, they've already been uh, performing their sacrifices yearly, right, uh, throughout the, the festivals uh, after the Passover and everything. And so Israel already had a sort of idea of the path in which they should take. Um, Solomon, he's just kind of making it a little more clear. Uh, it, it seems as though, you know, he's, he's sharing, if you were to live a righteous life, this is how you should live. However, anything contrary to that is definitely going to be wicked. Uh, so we're moving in to chapter 12, verse 1. And he starts, he says, whoso loveth instructive, Whoso loveth instruction loveth knowledge, but he that hateth reproof is brutish. A good man obtaineth favor of the Lord, but a man of wicked devices will he condemn. A man shall not be established by wickedness, but the root of the righteous shall not be moved. So again, as I was saying, we're seeing this contrast, right? Um, the, per the, the righteous person he who loves instruction, right? All, 
because he loves instruction, he loves to have this knowledge, right? He knows how this instruction uh, will bring knowledge into his life. He knows how this knowledge he could then apply into wisdom so that he can continue to walk in his life. But the person that doesn't like to be corrected is a brute, right? Is, is brutish, is what King James says. Um, other translations, let's see, let me pull something up real quick. You know, that, that word brutish, it, it's kind of like, you know, that, what, what would you say, like a hard exterior? Somebody who's kind of rough, somebody who's uh, maybe a little ignorant, right? Maybe not well-educated, right? Somebody who a um, bit rough around the edges, right? Brutish. Uh, other translations would say stupid. That is what the New Living Translation says. To learn, you must love discipline. It is stupid to hate correction. Um, the Christian Standard Bible would say, whoever loves discipline loves knowledge. So here we're equating um, in those two, actually, it, it looks like in all these uh, translations here, New International would say, anyone who loves correction loves knowledge. So we're equating instruction with being corrected. That's why uh, when we reprove somebody, we're correcting them. And that person who does not like to be corrected is considered a brute or stupid. Um, three of these translations, New Living Translation, Christian Standard Bible, New International Reader's Version, all say, if you hate to be corrected, you're stupid. Um, sounds maybe a little harsh, uh, especially when we say stupid, you know, we think of um, how that can be um, biting. And we're actually gonna see that here, here in a bit um, of how you know, our speech and our words can, can be biting to somebody, right? Um, in, the, in King James later on, Solomon's going to say they're like daggers, right? It's, it's almost like piercing swords when you, when you speak. So we've got to just be careful with how, how we use the context of this. But uh, at least uh, three of these translations here would equate somebody who does not like to be corrected as stupid. Um, brutish is probably going to be the nicest way of saying that although you think about that time it probably wasn't so nice verse 2 says a good man obtaineth favor of the lord but a man of wicked devices will he condemn um so in other words in other translations we're seeing that the lord approves of those who um are are seeking to do good who are good, right? Who are good in the eyes of the Lord. God approves of those, but he will condemn anybody who may act or plan on wickedness, whose intentions are wicked, right? Verse three says, a man shall not be established by wickedness, uh, but the root of the righteous shall not be moved. This reminds me a lot again of that parable of Christ uh, talking about the, man, the, the foolish man who built his house on the sand and the, the wise man who built his house on the rock, right? Uh, you have a foundation, right? And in order for that foundation to be established, it must be established on righteousness, on those things of above and not those things of, you know, here, here on earth, right? And because of that, you know, when we start establishing our, uh, we start building our establishment on a solid foundation, it won't be moved, it won't be swayed, right? We talk about um, tree, healthy trees, when the wind comes, they just blow back and forth, but an unhealthy tree, when the wind com comes, it snaps it, right? It breaks it, it, breaks it down, um, it, it does more harm to it when the wind comes through, right? Same thing here, um, if you're building your, uh, if you're trying to build or establish yourself on wickedness, it's not going to last. Uh, you think about people who, you know, they, they happen to do a lot of lying, right? They may, they may be the slander people to kind of get ahead, but those things eventually come back and bite them, right? Eventually they come full circle and they get discovered. Um, you see, I see this happen a lot, especially just in regular conversations. I see this happen a lot at work when people are trying to pass the buck instead of doing what they're told. You know, they might say a little lie and try to get out of what they may have done but it comes back around and it bites them it is it, it uh it's it's how, how do they say um well it's like how paul said you reap what you sow if what you reap is wickedness you will sow wickedness and so it's in that same instance if you try to build yourself on this sort of wickedness and you try to establish establish yourself 
in that wickedness and those wicked things that you have done, they will not have any sort of, they're not going to last very long at all. Um, and so that's where we see the contrast, but the root of the righteous shall not be moved, right? Other uh, translations would say, but the godly, they have deep roots. You know, when, when they're establishing themselves, when they're, when they're moving in this world, righteously doing right in the eyes of God, um, doing right by their neighbor, we see that God has a way of sort of helping them grow. Not to say that they're not going to have difficult times or hard times, but their roots begin to grow stronger. And like the tree, that a healthy tree, when that wind blows, that they, they may be swayed back and forth, but their roots are so uh, strong that the, the, the health of that tree is so strong that when that wind blows, they won't snap. They won't break, right? Verse four, Solomon says, a virtuous woman is a crown to her husband. But she that maketh ashamed is rottenness in his bones. You know, again, very simply, if Solomon was writing to his daughters, he would have said a virtuous man, right? But because he's writing to his son, we see that it's a virtuous woman that is a crown to her husband. Um, I was listening to a sermon and um, this, uh, the, the pastor was saying how a lot of people use this in context of, you know, how a woman uh, should should behave. Um, he brought up something very, you know, it, it made a lot of sense to me. Um, verse four, right here in chapter twelve, along with chapter thirty-one. You know, a lot of people we we call that, you know, the, um, you know, how, we use that as an example of how to be a godly woman, right? For women, to, how to be a godly woman. Uh, he uses this example as how a godly man what a godly man should seek for in a godly woman uh which made a lot of sense if solomon is writing this to his son you know he's trying to make sure that his son knows um you know what kind of woman he should marry especially with the experience that solomon had um 700 wives 300 concubines he had quite uh quite a detailed experience right of of women of their behaviors of um, you know, each kind of different personalities. I mean, you think each and every one of us have a different uh, personality and not one of us are the same. However, you know, Solomon being close to, you know, a thousand women was able to have a very close experience with them. Uh, uh, Sister Pat, I see you got your hand up. Yes, good morning, everybody. Morning, um, morning. Uh, when you started this verse, I immediately thought of Brother uh, Trey Beard's uh, sermon on Sunday and how he introduced the concept of what God meant for uh, uh, the man and the wife and husband relationship in describing the woman as an easer. I, I found that very, very fascinating. Yeah, it, say, say that last part, he found, he found the woman as, I, I may have I, missed that part. He defined the woman as an easer, E-Z-E-R. Okay. And uh, as a matter of fact, I, I Googled it af after the sermon was over and it, and he actually quoted some of the uh, things that were in the article I read. And I just thought it was really amazing how he pointed out that the man and woman should be basically equals. Right. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at that definition right now. Yeah, that's, you know, that, that's. It's interesting because men and women, we're, we're equal, but we're not the same, right? We're, we're equal because we're both made in God's image, but we're both created for different, uh, for, for different purposes, right? We're, we're men, um, and, and again, this, you know, this is something in, that I've been learning as a Christian, the roles of men and women in this world, and to see how twisted the roles have become of men and women it you know is now in my time um i think about 30 years ago when i was eight years old the roles were they were they were starting to flip but they weren't as skewed as they are now and so now we're kind of in a society that believes that 
men and women are not only just equal, but that they are the same. They are so much the same that they can, you know, flip flop back and forth. You know, if I decided tomorrow I wanted to be a woman, I could shave my face and um, start dressing like a woman and say, hey, Vidal is no longer Vidal, right? I'm something, I'm, I'm now female. Uh, if I wanted to do that, society now says that that's totally fine. But when we start seeing ourselves in the roles in which, you know, we're original, which we have originally been given, you know, we can see how somebody can be, you know, a woman can be the easier for the man, especially when they're seeking God together, um, you know, that, that they're bound by this sort of marriage yoke, right? And I think so much about what Christ said about taking on my yoke because my yoke is light, you know, that marriage yoke, it's going to get a little rough, you know, if we remember what the yoke is like, you know, it's this bar that goes around the, the oxen's neck, right? And it rubs a little bit. If you're, if that yoke isn't measured right, it's going to keep rubbing the wrong way, right? But when you have a, a spouse that is uh, godly, you know, a spouse that is doing everything they can to draw closer to God, that yoke kind of fits right and so when both of you are in unison on that it's it makes things uh m much easier and so yeah you can see how that's an easier um for for that party right for uh both well actually for both parties because when you're both in um on the same page when you're both seeking god in the same way uh it, it's it makes things less difficult as opposed to when you know you're both out of alignment with each other you know you're both not on the same page one one person is seeking god the other person is seeking themselves um instead of trying to uh rectify you know that marriage but yeah it's really interesting uh, yes i'd like to say to anyone who's on on the uh call this morning who did not hear the sermon the 11 30 sermon on sunday you're doing yourself a disservice not not to go back and listen to it because it was very very spiritually uplifting and and informative yeah man I'm, I'm you know i'm really glad that orpheus is doing this uh series uh especially on the family because i mean the 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 family that god has put in place is is under attack right now um and and uh, almost every form uh you can think of it's under attack in schools it's under attack in government I mean, it's definitely under attack just in public. Um, you know, they're, they're, the world is adding their own definition of what a family should be. And so, you know, it's it's up to us if we're really, you know, going to be strong believers of, of God and his plan that we need to stand up for those things that are, that, that are wrong, you know, um, especially when it comes to the family unit. Um, it's, it's a very important thing that, that we can be able to address, especially when we're speaking to, to unbelievers, pardon me. Um, but yeah, so in verse four, we're seeing, you know, that a virtuous woman or a virtuous man, somebody, you know, we're talking about a person's character here. Um, the, these sort of things, they, they bring honor to the spouse, right? They bring honor to um, to our lives when we have a person of, of good character as a spouse in our life it says but she that maketh a shame is as rottenness in his bones that right there um i don't know if anybody's ever experienced that sort of uh th that feeling of being with somebody who has exploited you or has hurt you um uh, emotionally or physically but that experience, I mean, I, I, for one, have felt that in the past as well as pass that experience on to others um, in the past as well to girlfriends. Um, I, I, as much as I hate to admit it, I, I know there have been times where my wife may have uh, been ashamed of, the, of my own actions. And, you know, those are things that I had to own up to. And in the, for the, you know, for offending my wife you know i had to apologize for those things and be able to make sure that we are rectified that we can be able to move forward um and that i don't fall back in, into those things that have brought her shame 
but it's not a good feeling. You know, it's, it's a terrible feeling when you're with somebody who you love and trust and they betray you. Um, and that betrayal, it sort of it festers. It doesn't, it, it's, it's hard to come out of it, right? Um, it takes a lot of forgiveness to be able to move forward from those things. Um, but it's, it's almost one of those things where it's like, you don't even, you, you feel sick inside, right? Like sometimes you don't even want to forgive this person because you don't know if you can trust them again, right? It, you, their character is not only, not only a, a mar on them, but it's also kind of affecting you. People may see you differently. Um, you know, it, it's, it's kind of one of those things. It's the company you keep kind of makes up who you are. Right. And if I'm allowing myself to be with a certain person who is bringing shame to me, who is not virtuous, it it affects me. Right. In, in the long run, if I continue to live that way, I just uh, continue to let myself be affected by these sort of things. Right. And and it hurts. You know, you live in, a, in that kind of uh, relationship for a long enough time you become so used to it. It's almost like a, like Stockholm syndrome, right? You, you start to, uh, you, you're almost kind of like entrapped in this sort of relationship. And then you start to have, um, you know, feelings of justification for the people who are making you uh, feel this way, right? And they're like, well, you know, they're not always like this. And you start giving them excuses, right? Uh, New Living Translation says, a worthy wife is a crown for her husband but a disgraceful woman is like cancer in his bones. And you literally translation didn't, didn't hold back on that, right? Um, you think about how, how cancer is, right? It kills you on the inside, but on the outside, you might still look not bad. But as that illness progresses, you know, you become more frail. Your, your countenance, right? Your appearance starts to take a hit. Your body is becoming weaker and weaker. You think about that rottenness in his bones, the bone might still look intact, but on the inside, it's brittle, right? That, cal that calcium is, is depleting. And next thing you know, that bone, it's gonna snap. Just like, the, just like those, those uh, dead and weak trees that I keep talking about. When, when that, the, the wind's moving, right? They snap, same thing with these, um, with these bones when we're living in this sort of relationship and we're allowing ourselves, never addressing it and never doing anything to help fix that situation, um, you know, we become brittle, you know, our inside, we, we will snap, we'll bend to anything and we'll snap because we're living in this sort of way that, um, that, that is bringing a, a, a shame, that's bringing shame to us. It's bringing dishonor to us. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not a fun experience of anybody who's ever been in a relationship maybe even in their marriage now or before they got married um, can attest to that. I, I know I can attest to that. I've been in places where I've been betrayed and, um, you know, I was brought, I was, shame was brought upon me because of the girl that I was dating. Same thing, uh, just as I said, I brought shame on my wife in one instance early on in our marriage. And so I can, you know, I saw how that affected her. It reminded me of how it affected me right? Being betrayed in a way like that. Um, it, it's, it's not a fun feeling. And it's something that it's a big disservice to your own spirit uh, and to your own walk if you allow yourself to keep living in a way like that. Uh, Sister Chris, I see you, you wanted to add something? Right. You good? Okay. Verse five, it says, the thoughts of the righteous are right, but the counsels of the wicked are deceit. The words of the wicked are to lie in wait for blood, but the mouth of the upright shall deliver them. The wicked are overthrown and are not, but the house of the righteous shall stand. So right now, verse five, six, and seven, we're seeing um, again, this contrast between the righteous and the wicked. And in this case, we're speaking, we're, we're he's touching more about speech, right? Uh, speech really affects a lot of things that we do. Um, how, you know, how we uh, come across, right, how we say things. Um, and as, as I was saying earlier, the way we say things can come off in a rude way sometimes. Um, I was just having this discussion with somebody at work about 
how I speak. And he was like, yeah, Vidal, but sometimes the way you talk to people could come off as rude. You might not be rude, but it's your tone that you're using. And I have to, I completely agree. There's times when my tone is not the nicest way of saying things. Um, and it, and it sounds like I'm being a bit of a jerk, right? Or it sounds like I'm being very curt, uh, very standoffish. Like, look, this is it. That's how it's done. Keep moving. Kick rocks. Um, is the way I sound when I when I'm speaking, uh, especially to guests that come in 20, 30 minutes after we've already closed. Um, and that's something that I work on being able to be gracious in my speech, even after, you know, services are done, right? Even after I'm done for the day, I'm really not done for the day until I go to bed. And that's how I had to see my walk, right? But we're seeing here that the 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 righteous speak a certain way while the wicked speak in, in, in the contrary way, way, right? So verse five, he says, the thoughts of the righteous are right. Um, so anybody who is a righteous man is, you know, con is typically constantly thinking on righteous things, which are going to be those things from above, right? You think about a lot what Paul tells, uh, I believe, the, uh, the church at Colossae, you know, think on things above, don't think on things of this world. You know, this world is only really offering you material things um, aside from abstract concepts like reputation, right? Having a good name, um, th th those sort of things. This, this world only offers you so much. While you seek things from above, you're going to be offered much, much more. You'll have, you'll have greater riches. So the thoughts of the righteous are right. The thoughts of the righteous are always thinking on those things from above, right? Uh, New Living Translation say the plans of the godly are just, right? So the way a righteous person thinks is always uh, a way that is not only going to benefit themselves, but more importantly, is going to benefit their neighbor, is going to bring glory and honor to God, right? Um, while the, uh, but the counsels of the wicked are deceit very plainly, you know, when a wicked person gives you advice and check it twice because it, it, it's more likely going to be something that is going to hinder you right it's more likely going to benefit themselves before it benefits anybody else uh and that's something that we have to be very careful with when we're when we're um seeking advice we have to know who we're seeking this counsel from right verse six it says the words of the wicked are to lie and wait for blood but the mouth of the upright shall deliver them. So, you know, again, we're going back to speech. You know, the words of the wicked, New Living Translation would say they're like murderous. It's like a murderous ambush. You know, the words of wicked people, you gotta watch out because they will tear you down. Um, maybe sometimes they might even say something that'll build you up just so they can later kind of kick it out from underneath you. Um, I've, I've seen that happen. I've, I've done that in the past, you know, it's so interesting every time, anytime I read, uh, as long as actually in the past, when I was reading Proverbs, I never really thought much of it. I was like, oh, this is just the right way of living, wrong way of living. And now that I'm reading Proverbs and we're discussing it and, and, and we're analyzing it, I find just how wicked I used to be just just how much of a terrible person before Christ I was, because a lot of these things I have, I have done in the past. Um, and, and to be, to be perfectly frank, it, it brings me a lot of shame thinking about just how bad I used to be. I used to be a really horrible person. When I see, you know, the contrast between the righteous and the wicked, there really wasn't a middle line. It was, it was either I was wicked or, you know, I did some things right. But for the most part, I was a, a, a very wicked person. As I'm reading this, I see it's like the the words of the wicked, as like the New Living Transla Translation says, they can be like a murderous ambush. They come out of nowhere. They'll hit you, right? They, they don't care about your feelings. Uh, and, and we, you know, wicked people, re we really don't. We don't care about another person's emotions. We don't care about their situations. We only care about wanting to get off, get uh, what we have on us out. And I can't, I can't hold on to it anymore. You know what? Bam. I just hit you with everything. And I don't care how you feel about it, right? Um, other translations, uh, New International Reader's Version says, the words of those who are evil hide and wait 
to spill people's bloods. Very, very specific, right? The words of of evil people, of wicked people, man, they're gonna they're gonna sit there, they're gonna wait for you, right? And when you're when when you may be at your best, they're gonna come at you and hit you with all these things. I've been holding back. I've been I've I've been I've had this I've had this in my pocket waiting for you, and now I got it. And so here it is. And that's exactly how um, how, how wicked people behave. This, this is exactly how uh, people who do not have Jesus in their life behave. Uh, and it's it, it's a sad way of saying it. I'm not going to say all of them behave like that, but many, many, many people um, who who are walking in this world without Christ, this is the same way. And, and I see this too, and so a lot in social media. You know, if you go to a very controversial post, you will see people going back and forth with each other, kind of, kind of like a fight, right? A messed up knife fight because people start saying all kinds of horrible, despicable things when you're not in front of each other. You know, if it's only a keyboard between me and you, then I am going to shame your family. I'm going to say horrible things about you. And this is, and this, I see this exact same thing playing out all the time on social media. People say some despicable things. They behave despicably to each other. And, and then we wonder why our culture is in such a downward uh, spiral, right? He says, but the mouth of the upright shall deliver them or the words of the godly actually saves lives is what the New Living Translation says. Um, Christian Standard Bible says that the speech of the upright is actually what rescues them. Um, and so we see this contrast. Either we can be uplifting people and be righteous, or we can look, turn our nose down to people and, and sort of base them, right? De debase them, right? Make them lower than what they are. So, so what do we choose to live like? And as Christians, we should always choose to have, you know, um, an upright speech towards people. Uh, David, uh, the psalmist would say that I would not let any wicked word come out of my mouth. That's so difficult. That is one of the hardest things I have found at, as I'm walking that because I don't want to curse anymore, you know, I end up replacing that, that word with something else. But in the end, I'm still cursing because even just because I've replaced my language. Right. And so that's one of the most difficult things I find is when we're trying to uh, make sure that no wicked words or language or speech comes out of our mouth. You know, we have to be careful to not just say it at all. Right. Oh, we're looking for a word to replace something because we're trying not to curse. It's it's something that um, I believe I heard somebody in our class in the past say it, but it's also something that my mother told me as I was growing up. It's like just because you you're not saying the F word, but you're saying F doesn't mean you're not cursing. You're still cursing because what you mean is what you're trying not to say. And that's something that I've, you know, now, I mean, I got baptized in 2016. I've been baptized for five years. In the last five years, I've, that, that's, that's one of the biggest things on my mind is to not replace a curse word, but to just take it out of my vocabulary altogether. That's one of the most difficult things, but we see that a lot of time that those words that we use, especially when we're trying to replace something, they can be just like these wicked people who are lying in wait for blood, even if we're trying to replace it, right? We could be, we could easily be behaving in such a way. Um, and so it's very important that we don't, that, that we don't give ourselves over to this. Verse seven, he says, the wicked are overthrown and are not, but the righteous shall stand. Um, very simply put, you know, the wicked won't stand, right? The, the wicked, they, um, they will be tossed. This is a, this is a, uh, a promise. Um, it's clear that there, there have been wicked rulers um, that may have ruled for many, many years, you know, five, 10 years, in my opinion, is too many years, right? But, but it's clear that they would have an, an instance of success but eventually they, they are toppled, right? They are overthrown. We see this throughout the entire Old Testament, um, especially after the kings of Israel um, decided to go their own way, right? After God 
split the nation in two and gave 10 tribes to, uh, to Jeroboam and then Rehoboam kept two tribes, right? Um, we, we see the progression of these two rulers and how they would split off. And so each time they would go into some kind of transgression, uh, the, uh, the four nations would come in and they would start stirring up strife and stirring problems up with the nations. And so they would, you know, those rulers would be toppled over. They'd be overthrown. But this right here I see is more of a, um, a promise of what's to come, right? A promise of, of God's grace, of, of what's going to happen in the end. Those wicked people who did not seek God, they will be overthrown. But the house of the righteous will stand. The house of the people who have sought after God, who have kept his commandments, who have kept his precepts, they're the ones that, that are going to survive everything that happens in the end. So much so that they have an inheritance waiting for them, right? Um, the, the house that, um, that our father built, right, is what we're, is, is what we're waiting for as far as... Uh, you know, that, that righteousness that will stand. Verse eight, he says, a man shall be commended according to his wisdom, but he that is of a perverse heart shall be despised. Um, again, very simply put, wise people, they're, they're held in high esteem, right? We see this a lot in, uh, with science, with scientists. Um, it seems like the more degrees that a person has, um, the more knowledge a person obtains, sort of the, the higher up in position we, we kind of place him in society. Um, we see this in academics. Uh, um, we see this at college levels, right? Uh, that greater tenure, the, the greater length a person, uh, a professor has in, in an institution, kind of more revered they are among the faculty and among the, 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 the students, right? Um, th this is... I think a very basic sort of observation of, of people. You think about um, our, our nation's rulers, they have counselors and those counselors, you know, they, they hold them in a high regard and high esteem. And so it's very, um, it is, is a very basic observation, I, I think, of how we see people. So when we're holding a person in, in a sort of high regard or high esteem, we have to be very careful about the things that they're speaking on, right? Um, we, we don't want to just hold anybody in high regard or high esteem. We see this a lot in prosperity preaching. Um, you know, prosperity preachers say some really good sounding things. Man, they say they say things that makes make me want to follow them because I, if that's true, oh my goodness, I, I want to serve that God. But I know that's not true. I, I know that um, there's some things that are going to have to be suffered for, right? That I know that not everything is going to be easy. I know that even if I work hard, there, there may be an obstacle still there that I have to overcome, right? Um, so it's very, very, um, I have to be very careful about who I align myself to. Um, but again, I think this is a very, very sort of, and I don't want to say basic, like, oh, it's basic. I want to say that this is, a, a, a very standard sort of observation of life people who are wise are held in high esteem it says but he that is of a perverse heart shall be despised again you know we're living in this society that is skewed right that has turned evil good and good evil um that has taken those things that are right and flipped them upside down right so it's becoming increasingly difficult for uh, society for people in the world to know who is of a perverse heart right to know who is of a righteous heart um in, in their view they 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 may be uh helping themselves and not helping others and they may see this as right they may see it as perverse uh it's becoming difficult for people to see the difference in the two uh, and, and it's very important that we as as disciples of christ know um you know who is wise so that we can seek them and seek their counsel and who is of a perverse heart so that we can stay away from them and mo more so share with them that gospel message 
so that they can, so that they too can also change their heart. Um, you know, one of my biggest prayers is that is, is from, is what God told, tells Ezekiel is that he take my heart of stone and put in me a heart of flesh so that I could understand and know, and that when I sin, I can feel that and not be just uh, sort of disaffected, right? Kind of, eh, you know, I sin. I'm sorry, God, right? Um, I, find, I find that that feeling has grown smaller and smaller. While when I do sin, it hurts greater and greater, it hurts myself greater and greater. Um, we're we're going to see Solomon say that in a bit as well. Um, I'm not sure if it's this chapter or the next chapter, but, you know, feeling that heaviness, it, it makes you stoop, right? Uh, heaviness in the heart is what it says, makes you stoop. I've, you know, I've, I've, there's times when I've f- literally felt that um, when I have sinned, I feel that heaviness that I don't want to do anything. I just, I, my, my demeanor becomes lower and lower and I'm so ashamed of myself that I even look shameful, right? I've kind of cowered a bit. I don't know what to do with my life. But when I don't have that in my life, I've, I'm kind of uplifted, right? I am uplifted. I'm not, not kind of, I, I am uplifted. Uh, verse nine, he says, he that is despised and hath a servant is better than he that honoreth himself and lacketh bread. You know, that word despised, um, I was looking and it's used a handful of times in different sort of contexts. Um, you know, we think despised, we think somebody who is hated. Um, but in this context, we're seeing it's more of a, um, like an everyman, right? A, a nobody. Some translations would say, um, let me see it real quick, let me find it. Um, so New Living Translation would tell you that it's better to be an ordinary person with a servant, right? Um, Christian Standard Bible says it's better to be disregarded and and have a servant. New International Reader's Version would say being nobody and having a servant is better. Um, so we, we see this word despise. It doesn't necessarily mean to uh, hate somebody, but that's typically the context in which we use it nowadays. You know, we despise something is that we hate, right? Somebody. However, um, we see this being used in the context here um, as, you know, an, an everyman, an ordinary person, uh, your, uh, uh, your average Joe, right? Let me find, I wanted to find something right quick here. Um, despised. Oh, go back. Sorry, y'all. Um, but, but it's interesting how this, how this, we see this word and we automatically kind of um, equate it to somebody who is hated. You know, when I think of despise, I think of something that I really do not like. Something, so, something, or someone that um, I, I, it's, it's almost, it's like nails, it's like nails on a chalkboard, right? Uh, the outline of biblical usage for the word despise is to disgrace or dishonor, uh, to be lightly esteemed is what I would say this is in the context of. Uh, so to be lightly esteemed would be somebody who doesn't, you know, doesn't have a, a high place in society, right? But at the same time, this person has a servant. Um, he might just be an ordinary person, but he's but he's got um, some some wealth, right? He's got some things. It's better to be this person that has a little than to be somebody who says you have a lot but you have nothing right? Somebody who honors himself, but doesn't even have a piece of bread to feed himself. It's, I would rather be this normal, ordinary person who is walking through this world, paying my bills, um, being able to um, use my wealth for, for righteous things, than to be a person who holds, you know, I think a lot of myself, but I don't, I don't have food. I probably don't have a home to call my own, right? I, I, I don't have uh, all these things that I say I'm worthy of, right? I, I just think, I just think really big of myself. Um, personally, that's, I used to be that very same way. 
Um, you know, I lived in a shack, maybe the size of my kitchen when I met Miranda. And before I met her, you know, I was still living in a way where I was like, man, I got, I do what I want. I got it all. I could do anything, but yet I go home to the shack. I go home to something that is, um, it, it's not very honorable. You know, you're living in somebody's backyard instead of being able to build your own home, right? Instead of being able to take care of yourself in a way where, you know, you, you're, you're living, um, I don't want to say righteously because I wasn't living righteously, but even at that, um, you know, you're, you're taking care of your basic needs. Um, you know, living in a, I didn't even have a kitchen, right? I couldn't even cook myself a, a bowl of ramen, right? I, I had a microwave and a mini fridge, um, bachelor life, <laughs> right? Um, and, and I thought at that time that I was doing myself something good, that I was, I was holding myself up, right? I, I'm, I honored myself, but I didn't have anything. It was, that's a, I think about it now, that, that's shameful to live like that. You know, to be a 30 year old man and to, to live in, in a shack in the backyard of a family's home. And so it, it's, it's, it's a humbling experience if, um, you know, if, if nobody's ever gone through that, it's a very, very humbling experience because you realize, man, all those things you've been talking to Dow, man, you, 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 you're talking out the other end, you know? Like, how can you honor yourself so much when you don't even have anything to be able to share with somebody, right? You couldn't even, I couldn't even feed myself. Verse 10, a righteous man regardeth the life of his beast, but the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. Um, this is, you know, very simply put, uh, if, if you have pets, you know, you're, you're, you're going to take care of them in the context of what this, when this was written, you know, animals were used for plowing the field, right? Uh, you had cattle to, and goats to sort of graze the land, right? Um, horses and camels were used to be able to transport goods back and forth. But you have to take care of that animal in order for it to do the job that you're trying to have it do, right? You can't, um, it, it's interesting. I think about taking my dog for a walk and there's moments where, on this on this path where we live by, there's glass, and you know she sometimes step in that glass, and she might give herself a scratch on her paw on her little pad, and she stops and she starts licking it. If I'm not paying attention, and I think she's just stopping just to sniff, and I start yanking, and I'm not paying attention to you know her hurt paw, her hurt pad, I end up hurting her even more. Same thing, you know, in this time when this was written, you know, a person was maybe had a, a a pair of oxen dragging a plow right one ox doesn't want to move and so what does the uh what does the owner do you know a, a wicked owner will probably take a switch and start beating that oxen until the oxen would move um a smart owner will probably give it some incentive you know i think a lot about that uh that image of a person riding a turtle with a carrot on a stick in front of them right and so you put the carrot in front of the animal and the animal's constantly chasing the, the uh, carrot, right? And you get the animal moving, you get the animal doing what it wants to do, right? It's, it's a very old image, um, very old saying, um, but it's, it's a, in contrast to how a wicked person would treat their animal, especially if you're out there, you're trying to use this animal uh, to better your farm, right? Uh, uh, you use this animals of integral part of your daily life. You know, you want to take care of this animal so that it could continue to do the things that you needed to do. Um, but the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. I love the jump here because a righteous man will take care of an animal, but a wicked person, no matter how nice they are, it's still cruel, right? Uh, no matter no no matter how merciful they can be with somebody it's it's still wicked um other translations would say let me just pull it up right quick i thought i had it um new living translation says the godly care for their animals but the wicked are always cruel i mean it, it sounded a little nicer in king james when he says 
but the tender mercies, right? Because that, that it shows that, may, that the wicked can still have mercy, but even those tender mercies are cruel. Um, they, no, they're not going to change, right? It, it, doesn't, it doesn't change how they are. Uh, Christian Standard Bible says, but even the merciful acts of the wicked are cruel. They might think they're being merciful, but the person receiving that quote unquote mercy, they, they, they'll they tell you it's still, it's still cruel. It's still wicked, right? Uh, verse 11, he that tilleth his land shall be satisfied with bread, but he that followeth vain persons is void of understanding. So somebody who, who's out there, uh, you know, working um, will we'll have plenty, right? Uh, King James is saying, he, if you work the land, you'll be satisfied with bread. New Living Translation says, a hard worker has plenty of food. Um, Christian Standard says, one who works his land will have plenty of food. And New International says, those who farm their land will have plenty of food. So if you're a good worker, you're going to, you're, you know, and if you work hard, not so much if you're a good worker, but if you work hard, um, you know, you're, you're not going to, you're probably not going to be hungry. Um, right now we're living in, in a, in a state where uh, things are becoming more expensive. So I do believe it is a matter of time um, before there are uh, these sort of food shortages. I was thinking a lot about, um, I'm hearing a lot of people talk about Mark of the Beast type things in this world. And I have to remind myself what the Mark of the Beast was, especially when John wrote this, you know, um, and the context in which he wrote it, how, you know, you will not be able to buy or sell without this mark. Um, you know, there's, there's instances where I can see that happening. But especially now, you know, we live in a time where Okay, I might not be able to the grocery. I might I may not be able to go to the grocery store because I don't have this mark. But you know, you have Amazon, right? You have Whole Foods, you have Kroger. These you have Publix. They deliver. You don't have to go to the store. They deliver. So it's not really mark of the beast quite yet. But at the same time, we're seeing you know uh, other nations are following this sort of system of government, uh, namely socialism. And we're seeing that the people and the citizenry of these nations, they're, they're dying of starvation. Uh, think about Venezuela. I mean, people in Venezuela right now, they're, they've, the government has nationalized their oil reserves. Uh, they've nationalized education. They've nationalized health. Uh, people are fleeing Venezuela because there's, there's food shortages. There's gas, or, gas shortages. There's water shortages. Um, it's difficult to be able to uh, go to the doctor to seek any kind of medical attention. Uh, I mean, people are standing in lines wrapping around city blocks just to be able to get into a grocery store that may not even have eggs and bread and ham and cheese, uh, you know, to feed your family. This is happening throughout, throughout the world and other socialist and communist countries, um, which reminds me a lot of, you know, that, that third beast or that third horse that came out in, in Revelation, you know, uh, you will have, you know, your day's wage will be a bit of bread, right? <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, I'm seeing this in other nations. I only imagine how much longer before that comes here, you know, government programs that help you, um, that, that sort of help you be able to buy food and, and be able to have rent uh, for, for, for your bills, right? Instead of just being able to go out and work for a living, we're seeing people kind of giving themselves over. I mean, this last year with unemployment, um, people have gotten used to getting a check from the state or getting a check federally. And they make more on that than they would, you know, in their hourly wage, which I understand, um, you know, when you're living like that, you don't, you, why do I want to go back to a seven or eight an hour job when I'm making 600 bucks a week, 300 bucks a week? Um, for saying that I'm looking for a job, right? And so you start getting people that are that become dependent on this sort of thing and they don't want to work. You know, Paul says that the man who doesn't work doesn't eat, right? We're seeing here, Solomon says that if you go and you work, you, your things will be better for you as opposed to the vain person who uh, 
is is doesn't have that same sort of understanding who um you know you think of a vain person you remember what uh Kohilet says you know vanity is something that really can't be reached it's something that can't be understood and when you can't when you're when you become one of these people you know you you lose all kind of understanding and i've been seeing this especially right now in the workforce um how difficult it is to get people to to get people to want to come back to work um it's it's becoming a really uh a very real struggle struggle for many small business owners who rely on these people to be able to get uh you know be able to handle the services that they're offering um and it's 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 becoming scarier um because i i i truly believe that these you know people aren't instilled good work ethics anymore you know they're, they're not shown what it is to be a good worker you know a lot of a lot of young people they were handed up everything they were given everything so they expect everything they don't really expect to have to work hard to receive anything and and it's you know it's a complete disservice to them um i'm very grateful that both my mother and my father were you know they were hard on me you know they, when i dropped out of school they said either my, my mom said either you go back to school or you work because you're not going to live in this house with without working my dad you know i took a, before this pandemic uh, the last time I had gone without working, I was, I was like from 18 to 19. So like a year, um, I didn't do anything. You know, I went downtown. I, um, did a lot of things I wasn't supposed to do. I had a little like side hustle where, I mean, I had a lot of friends downtown San Antonio. So I would go to their businesses and I would, I would sort of, I would deliver food for them. I they called, I was like the original DoorDash. I would, they, I would show up, they would call in their orders. They give me the money. They let me keep the change. I mean, I'd make 30, 40 bucks a day doing this, you know, as an 18 year old, 30, 40 bucks a day, throw in five, 10 bucks on some beer with the guys at the end of the night. The, the rest of the money's mine. I could do whatever I want. I always had whatever I wanted. Although I was living a life of, of slothfulness because I wasn't really working for anything. You know, I was still a kid. Um, before my dad passed away, he said, I'm really worried that I didn't teach you to work because now here you are, you're living with your mom, you're not paying any rent um, and, and you're not working. That's not, that's not what I taught you, you know? That's not what your mom taught you. You need to work hard if you expect uh, to, to get anything done in life. And, you know, when my dad passed away, I had just gotten a job. Um, you know, I worked at Subway for seven years after that. Um, and it's interesting, since that point, any job that I've had, um, I've, I've in, I'm 16, uh, I started working when I was 16, more than half my life, I've only had maybe like six or maybe six different jobs, maybe seven in, in more than half my life, right? So in more than 20 years, so I started working on 16, I'm 38 now, in more than 20 years, I've held, I've only had maybe six or seven jobs long-term right? I've ne uh, if it wasn't for that talk that my dad had given me, I'm, I may had never, I may have never have gone back to work and just been one of these people who are out, you know, scamming people, hustling people, finding ways to make my own money without having to uh, really, uh, uh, you know, pay taxes on it, you know, that kind of thing. And so it's really, um, it was, I'm, I'm really grateful that my dad talked, told me that because I saw what kind of shame I was bringing on him. Here I am, this 18 year old kid who's, you know, living off mom. I mean, all, although I, it was more of a storage facility, right? Like my stuff was at my mom's house. I would show up to just change and, and, and take a shower and then I'd be gone for who knows how long after that. But I see the shame that it brought on my dad, even though my dad wasn't, you know, a, a, a just a, a Christian, you know, my, my dad was living in the world he had a very strong sense of pride when it came to work. And that's something that a lot of young people, they don't have now because they were given everything. You know, I, right now with my son, I do my very best to teach him right now. Hey, at the end, you know, before you go to bed, clean up, you know, got to teach him work, teach him to clean, to be clean after himself, 
right? That alone, and when he gets older, will go with him, whether he decides to go to college or whether he uh, is in his own, you know, marriage relationship, his own marriage, he'll know that he can't just be leaving stuff around for somebody else to clean up. He has to clean up after himself. That very simply right now, as a, at, at three years old that I'm teaching him, he will carry with that with him all the way to till he dies. He will care that he needs to clean up for himself. He cannot expect people to clean up after him. Uh, and that's, you know, that right now is something that I'm, I'm grateful that I can, that I am alive to be able to teach my son that because I would hate for him to grow up thinking that people, um, that, that he, uh, that people are responsible for cleaning up after him, that he has no sense of responsibility um, for himself and for the things that he does, right? All right, we're gonna we're gonna stop right there. Um, so that was Proverbs uh, chapter twelve. We'll pick it up in verse twelve next week. Um, before we go, and before we take prayer requests, um, did anybody have any thing they'd like to add? Any comments or questions that we might have before we, before we do a prayer request? Excuse me. Great class, great class. Thank Definitely you. a great class, Brother Vidal. Thank you. I thank just you. wanted to say, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, Proverbs make you do a self-examination. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, and listening to you, it, it even made me uh, really internalize it more, you know, and think about, you know, those things. I, I'm so grateful to God. I have, you know, sometimes tears just come to my eyes, you know, just thinking about what he has brought me through and, and where he, you know, has me now. And, and I look forward to even greater things, but he has been so good to me. And I tell you, it, it feels good. And yeah, Proverbs definitely make you look at yourself. Oh yeah. It's and, a, amen. It's like a mirror, you know, and, and you know, you think about it, you, how many times have you read, have you read Proverbs and you don't really like, you know, you read it and you're like, okay, that's, you know, something I'll pray on. But like right now in our study, I've, I mean, I'll, I'll read a chapter maybe four or five times bef before we do our study. You know, I, I listen to different sermons throughout the week on that chapter. And I just look at myself and I'm like, man, Vidal, like this, this is you, like this was you. <laughs> And even, even now as a Christian, I still find myself, I'm like, okay, I'm falling back into that video. Come on, get, get back on this side. Because, because we're seeing this contrast, right? We're seeing the differences between what it is to live a, a wicked life and what it is to live a righteous life. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's very important that we can hold the mirror up to ourselves every day, you know, before we become you know, one of these sort of haughty sort of people, right? Before we become one of these people who just think we got it all figured out. No, no, we don't. That's why we need Jesus. And that's, that's exactly why we need, you know, the word of God to hold that mirror up to us so that we could see, we, we could keep ourselves in line, you know, and, and not just the word of God as a mirror, but fellowship with each other, because that also helps sharpen us you know these fellowship with each other and god's word those, those, that's a mirror that we need to be able to uh keep us focused on on the, the word and focused on god um focused on his precepts right yeah amen all right y'all uh anybody else like to add anything All right, y'all. I see uh, Sister Kinnebrew has left a prayer request in the chat. She says, please continue to pray for her family and herself. Um, all who are ill, who've lost loved ones, who've lost their homes and their jobs. Um, she says, everyone have a blessed day and remainder of the week. Thank you so much, Sister Pat. And we will most certainly will keep you and your family in prayer. Um, and you're right, we know, continue to keep praying for, you know, everyone you know and it's not just it, it, 
it's not just COVID, you know, it's, it's everything, you know, everybody's battling different um, illnesses and diseases. And so, you know, we, we have to, we have to keep each and every one of us in prayer. Um, it, it, it's, it's hard, you know, there's, we, we kind of get caught up in our own lives sometimes that we, we forget that to, to reach out to others in prayer, you know, um, I, I said this a couple of weeks ago, you know, there's so many names I wish I could remember each and every single name that even writing down all the names, I sometimes miss a name. And, you know, I, I know that God knows my prayer and I'm grateful for that. Um, but definitely, Sister Kenry will definitely keep you and your family in prayer. Okay. This is Sister Chris Jackson. I just asked you all to continue to pray for my son Jarvis. Well, I got a call last night indicating that he have set up an infection in the lungs Ooh. along with bronchitis from the COVID-19. I just ask you all to continue to pray with me and for me and for him uh, that he would be able to pull through this. Amen. 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 Mm -hmm. Is he still at home, Chris? Yes, uh huh. They send him back home again. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, we show sure calling his name every day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Don't worry, God got him. He got your son. He got him in the palm of his hand, honey. Amen. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Bill, this is Vera Foster. Yes, yeah, Sister Foster. I'm asking for prayers for us to have traveling grace. My niece transitioned, so we'll be going to Nashville tomorrow. Got you. Thank you. My, my condolences. We'll be praying. Amen. And also, I'm I'm, I'm sorry. I I have another friend, close friend that I grew up with uh, down home in Augusta but she lives out in uh, Texas at this moment. And she's also battling with COVID-19 and she's still hospitalized herself. Her name is Penny Mitchell. Penny Mitchell. Mm -hmm. Amen. All right, y'all. Uh, Sister Wilburn has asked for, uh, she said, pray for the Wilburns. It's cloudy today. Uh, keep her in prayer as well as uh, Rob as well. We'll do Sister Wilburn. And tell Miranda, I said, hello. I didn't get a chance to speak to her in church with the baby uh, Sunday, but it was good to see her and the baby. Yeah, she'll be, uh, she'll be trying to make it out more often um, while I'm working. I told her, you know, I was telling her, I was like, you know, if I'm working when I go, one of us needs to be going to service. So um, she should be making it out more often. Oh, okay. Hey, girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> But, but yeah, she, she should she should be out there more more often, and um, I'm gonna be trying to get some um, uh, switch some days around so I can go yeah. go as well because I mean I am feeling it I am I've, I've been feeling it and I'm grateful for you know our Wednesday mornings, but I yeah I I can't wait to go back to the building yeah. you know I'd be able oh, to yeah. see it, oh, see yeah. everybody and hug everybody and be able to sing with everybody and. Uh, I mean, just, oh, yeah. just be able to get that fellowship in. I, I absolutely miss it. So, um, yeah. But, but yeah, she, she should be out there more often than now. now. She, she should be getting out there more. Okay. All right, y'all. Um, any, did anybody else like to add any prayer requests? I see we're missing a couple of people. Um, typically, anybody here from uh, Brother and Sister Moore this morning? 
Well, I spoke with Sister Moore uh, last night, uh, Monday night uh, on the Prayer Warriors line, and uh, she seems to be doing good. So uh, everything is okay. She just said her mother has some, you know, good days and some bad days. But, you know, we still keep her along with her mother in prayer. Amen. Amen. Absolutely. All right, y'all. We'll go ahead and um, close. One, one more, please. Yes. One more. Um, I talked to Todd Cornelius early in the week. He wasn't feeling well. Um, let's keep him in prayer and hopefully that he's feeling better soon. Amen. 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 And as you do, Brother Vidal, let's pray for everybody, include this world, everybody, Christians or not, prayers of the righteous in a great oh, class. Oh. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Amen. You know, that's, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it, it's, it's interesting how many people prayer can reach, you know, it, it really just blows my mind. I've said this in the past, you know, if, I didn't have people praying for me. I don't know where I would be right now. And I'm so great. I'm so grateful for it because I know where I was. And chances are, if nobody prayed for me, I'd, I probably may not even be there anymore. You know, I'd probably be dead. Rain is the eyes. Yeah. So thankful. So grateful. Amen. Amen. Yes, Amen. Lord. Mm -hmm. All right, y'all. We'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and close. Um, let us bow. Father, we thank you for this day, this opportunity to learn just a bit more of your word, that we can apply it to our lives, Father, that we can walk as these righteous and wise men walk that Solomon has told us about, that we can turn away from the wicked devices, uh, the, the wicked speech patterns, um, the, the wicked lifestyles, Lord, uh, in which we may have lived in the past, but you have brought us out of those things, Lord. We're asking prayers, Father, for those who are um, afflicted by disease right now and those who are recovering from it. Um, we're asking for prayers for uh, Jarvis Jackson and Penny Mitchell. Um, we're asking prayers for Sister Kinnebrew, for her family and for herself. Uh, prayers for uh, Sister Wilburn and Brother Wilburn, that you may give them brighter days, Lord, that you give them strength to continue to uh, walk in this world with the uh, afflictions that, that Rob has, Lord, but that you can continue to help them and guide them to walk to you in all of this. Uh, we're asking for prayers for Brother Cornelius Todd, that he may recover quickly from whatever it is, he, that what, from whatever may be ailing him, Lord. Um, prayers for uh, Brother and Sister Foster as they traveled to uh, Nashville. Lord, we just ask that you keep them and that you bring them home safely. Um, and, and prayers for this world, Lord. Uh, things are getting increasingly difficult for uh, the, the members in this world, for our brothers that are in Adam, Lord, and our brothers that are in Christ. We ask that those that are in Adam, that you guide them to see the error of the way they live and that they can seek you so that they can become our brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord. We know that you are patient so patient that you're willing to wait for each and every one of us to come to repentance, to love you, to seek you, to know you, Lord. And so I pray, Father, that you continue to be patient with us. But nevertheless, we pray that it's your will that's done and not our own. We thank you and we love you. And we pray this day be fruitful in a manner pleasing to you, Lord. And it's in Jesus' name we give you all glory and all honor. Yeah. Amen. 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 Everybody be safe. Keep your mask on. Yes. Social distancing. You tell them to be safe. Friends. Vaccinated if you're not. That That's was a right. good that was a good class, Vidal. Good class. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vidal. Yes, thank y'all. Uh, I'll thank be in soon. Thank you. That's that soon. That's that soon. <laughs> thank y'all. Thank y'all. Uh,